Good afternoon, Albuquerque. Thank you for joining this telephone town hall with Mayor Tim Keller. This is our seventh telephone town hall since March as we work to keep everyone updated in Albuquerque. For those of you who are wondering if you are connected, you are. Right now, you are in what is called listen-only mode, which means that you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. In just a moment, we will introduce Mayor Keller and other city leaders, and then we will open it up for questions. But first, let me go over a few housekeeping items. If you would like to ask a question, you can press star three on your phone and you will be put in line to speak with one of our staff members. Again, to ask a question, please press star three on your phone and you will be put in line to speak with one of our staff members. They will hop on, take down your name and your question, and then you will return to the town hall. Then, if you hear your name, you will be live to the entire conference and can ask your question directly to Mayor Keller and city officials. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. So please press star three right now if you'd like to ask a question. Again, press star, press star three right now to ask Mayor Keller a question. Along with Mayor Keller, we also have a number of city leaders joining us today who can speak to some of the specific questions folks here in Albuquerque have been asking. We have our Director of Economic Development, Cynthia Jaramillo. We have our Director of Family and Community Services, Carol Pierce. We have our Director of Senior Affairs, Anna Sanchez. We have Dr. Mark Femena, our Deputy Director of Environmental Health. We have Commander Josh Brown with the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, from our Office of Civil Rights, we have Tori Jacobus. And from uh, Albuquerque Community Safety, we have uh, Mariela Ruiz on that. Now, I would like to turn the conversation over to Mayor Kim Keller for some initial remarks before we jump into questions. Mayor, go right ahead. Well, good afternoon, Albuquerque, and I want to thank everyone for joining us on this telephone town hall today. We've hosted these really going back uh, six months ago, which, which feels like perhaps even longer, uh, just given corona and everything, but we've started this to try and just find different ways to communicate with folks in our city. And, you know, we do the usual uh, public communication through social media, and we try and also get things out to traditional media, but we also want to make sure that we have opportunities, especially now while we can't have traditional town halls, to make sure that we can at least have discussions over the phone. So for us, you know, we know we're facing serious challenges, and we continue uh, to face these challenges. And, you know, frankly, even looking back through our history, these are really unprecedented times for our city and, of course, for our country and in many ways worldwide, given the health crisis uh, and, of course, a, a wake-up call for racial justice. So we also know that this is uh, it's going to be a marathon, not a sprint, pretty much on every one of those topics. And so one of the things we'd like to focus on today, too, is thinking about uh, a little bit longer term, and I know EPS had some announcements with school and things of this nature, but all of this, unfortunately, is something we're going to have to deal with for quite some time. And I also know that people are experiencing a lot of, you know, kind of corona fatigue or whatever else you want to call it, and, and that certainly includes me. I mean, um, you know, fiddling with all the different face masks and trying to understand what's open and what's closed and what we can do and what we can't do. And, you know, at the end of the day, we know that our city, we buckled down early and we did a great job flattening the curve. And uh, for better or worse, we have to continue to put in that effort to slow the spread. And so I know a lot of us are tired and frustrated and many of us, too, are starting to feel economic constraints, financial constraints in our families because of what's going on. But we've got to remember what we're fighting for. Uh, we are fighting for the safety and health of our loved ones, of our coworkers, our neighbors, and our community. And so for us, it's important to remember that this is a challenge that we have to face with resolve, and I think also with some humility, and understanding that although we're fighting a, a common en uh, enemy, you know, we each face different challenges. And so in many cases, for example, staying at home is a luxury that some folks simply can't do because of either a situation uh, of childcare and work and so forth, or maybe they're essential. Uh, and therefore, it's also important for us to just be careful with the concept of shaming those who might uh, have to go to work or for those who are just in general in particular situations and remembering that, um, you know, it's we don't always know what's on the other side of, uh, of someone who's out in public or uh, not staying at home or even in certain cases, uh, face mask issues and so forth. So for us, we know that it is 
you know, there's an impossible decision that some people uh, face between being safe and paying their bills. And that's where our city's really trying to help, is make sure that that is not a either or problem. And it's really, we can do both. Uh, we can pay the bills and we can stay safe. And that's hard, that's a hard path. But that's why our city is continuing to support our community during this time. And that means things like providing safe childcare options at our community centers. It means providing free Wi-Fi uh, at different places so people can get it and access schoolwork and so forth. It means supporting our local economy where we try and navigate through reopening and tightening of restrictions. And so in Albuquerque, we continue to carve our own path. We find ways to try and be a safety net for our most vulnerable and also to keep the city operating, even city government, and continue to support our local economy. So for us, car carving our own path really means dealing with these challenges in a way that also should reflect the values of our community and the fact that we're in it for the long run. Uh, no matter what happens this week, no matter what restriction changes, there unfortunately is no silver bullet. And so we've got to do what we can uh, to literally save lives, but we've also got to understand that unfortunately because frankly of a lack of national leadership and coordination, um, we're probably going to be in this for a long time. And so that's also important to remember. And for us, you know, there's lots to dive into on this. I'm sure there's questions across a number of issues. Of course, there are non-corona related things going on in our city. There's also our continued fight for racial justice. Uh, and then there's everyday concerns, whether it's uh, the parks getting mowed uh, or what's going on in our animal shelters. We'll try and take as many questions as we can here today. And so with that, I'll, I'll cut it short and we'll get to questions. Thank you very much, Mayor, uh, and thank you to everyone who's joined us today for this telephone town hall. Uh, a reminder, if you are just joining us, you can press star three on your phone to ask Mayor Keller a question. Uh, press star three to be connected with our staff right now. Uh, Mayor, we'll jump right in, and we're seeing a, a lot of questions kind of along the same lines. Uh, folks are asking that it felt like, you know, Albuquerque, New Mexico, we were headed in a good direction on all of this, and, and what changed? Well, that's a, a really good question. I think that's fundamental to a lot of us, especially if we, you know, most of us are keeping an eye on what's happening in our community and we might have a little bit of a picture into what's happening around the country, uh, but we know our town. And all of a sudden it's like we woke up one day and, you know, we weren't doing as good with respect to all things keeping us healthy and safe. And there's a couple of things that have happened in reality to that. I think first off, you know, early on in New Mexico, we got ahead in many ways and in Albuquerque. And we really buckled down and we worked to flatten the curve. And that was a great thing. In fact, you know, Albuquerque, uh, we, we have been held up in a lot of ways as one of the few urban cities in, you know, a rural state that actually had much, much better uh, COVID containment policies than, than many of our peers. So when you compare ourselves to Phoenix and Denver and Austin, uh, we actually did much, much better than, than them, and we continue uh, to do that. For example, the number of cases just on a per capita basis, we have half as many per capita as all those other cities. But the problem is our number of cases is going drastically up, just like it is in those other cities. So the good news is we're starting from a much better place because we earned it, because we worked hard before. But uh, now we're starting to see the same things that are happening in other cities, at least in terms of rate of change. Now, part of this is also understanding that, unfortunately, in this case, uh, you know, Albuquerque is not an island. Uh, we are the largest metropolitan area in a thousand square miles. And we have, whether it's the Sunport or shopping malls or hospitals or UNM, uh, CNM, we draw in people, uh, especially on the weekends, from all over New Mexico and border areas, especially Colorado and uh, Flagstaff out in Arizona. So for us, we also know that, you know, we're not immune from what's happening in other places. And so uh, as we think about, you know, what's changed basically, as if folks haven't heard, you know, Arizona's rates are extremely high, and so is Texas. Colorado is a little bit better, but much higher than us. And no doubt uh, that is, is part of the contribution for spread that's now happening in Albuquerque. 
Now, as I mentioned, we also have seen, though, in our town, look, corona fatigue is real, and we do know that folks have been, you know, spending time with friends and getting together more and have been more lax about precautions. And so that has also reminded us that we've got to remain vigilant when it comes to what we're doing in our own town, too. So whether it's, it's big parties or businesses that are not enforcing masks, Things like this just can't happen. We've got to continue social distancing. Uh, we've got to continue wearing a mask, especially uh, when we're anywhere uh, outside our home around other people. And this is really the key. So for us, again, we've seen you know the same rates of change that we've seen around the country. But fortunately, we are building on a position of strength where uh, we did so good before we're hoping to be a little bit ahead again of all those cities around us. So I will say this, I know a lot of family that I have in uh, Phoenix and in Colorado and uh, even in Texas, and they all wish they lived in Albuquerque right now from a health perspective. And so I'm proud of that, but I wanna keep it that way. And that's why we've gotta to continue uh, to do our part. Great, thank you, Mayor. Again, press star three on your phone to ask Mayor Keller a question, star three to be connected with our staff. Uh, we're gonna go to live questions right now. And we're gonna start with uh, Talia, and Talia has a question about masks. Talia, go ahead, you're live on the line. Hi, um, I used to be an RN uh, quite a while ago, and uh, but I, I think there's a very practical thing that people need to know, and I would like this confirmed by infectious disease doctors, and that's that many people when they, or some people when they wear masks, do not cover their nose. And, you know, we all breathe in and out from our nose and our mouth, and so if the, the point of protecting ourselves and other people um, is to have a mask over where we're breathing, I think the nose is pretty important. Thank you, Talia, for that point. And uh, it's certainly from uh, at least what I've heard and learned, it's absolutely true. But to hear from one of our epidemiologists, I think Dr. Mark Domena is on, on our line. He's with our city environmental health department. And doctor, if you just wanna elaborate a little bit on that, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for that question. Um, this is something that we're trying to emphasize to people over and over again. As we're asking you to wear a mask, it's not just put the mask on, not just have a mask in your pocket. Um, and I believe Dr. Scrace showed this as well. The mask needs to cover both the nose and the mouth, just like you're saying. The mask is there uh, as much to protect other people from your exhalation as anything. So if you're breathing out through your nose, you're breathing out through your mouth, that can carry those respiratory droplets that we know transmit COVID. And as we're learning more that the mask gives you some protection as well, more than we initially thought that it did, you also want to be covering your nose and your mouth where you're breathing in, and that's going to give you some protection from becoming infected. So wearing the mask correctly on your face, over your nose, over your mouth, that's very critical to making what we're trying to accomplish there effective. Great. Thank you, Dr. Yamana. Uh, next, we are going to go to Marlene, and Marlene has a question about community centers. Marlene, go right ahead. Hi, I was curious, because um, the community centers actually do provide so much support as far as they even have health offices in, front, in them and GED programs and everything like that. Uh, is there any possibility that the community centers will be able to open up fully any time in the near future. Thanks, Marlene, and you're so right, uh, and that's something actually a lot of folks around town may not know. You know, our city has dozens of community centers, and for those folks who either, you know, live near one or happen to use them, they play multiple roles in, in our lives. And uh, and what we've been able to do, I guess, as you, you note, we've been able to keep them open for basically childcare, and that's been, you know, sort of a good way to to have that that safety net still in place in our city. But what I like about your question is you're highlighting all these other aspects that community centers provide, including in many ty types of cases, uh, health and other community development initiatives. So here's what we're ready to do. Uh, we're actually ready to our our city in general, and people may have noticed this. 
our approach is that we want to demonstrate leadership by opening whatever we're allowed to open, but in a healthy way. And I think the Botanic Gardens, for example, is a good example of this uh, in that, you know, we do metering, we do, we have people batched in pods, and there's all sorts of precautions that have made that situation really work. And it would have been easy to just keep it closed. But what we've done is we've demonstrated to the state and also most importantly to each other with in terms of health that we can open some facilities in a limited way. So we're poised to do that for community centers. Again, it would probably it could be by reservation or you might reserve a time slot. You know, so we have ways we can do this. Uh, but right now, uh, the state actually kind of has a general prohibition on that. So we're not allowed to do it. But I'm hoping that, you know, perhaps in August or September, we'll be able to do that. Again, it'll be very limited, right? And there's going to be all sorts of precautions. But we want to continue to just try and at least move in that direction, but in a healthy, uh, safe way and in a gradual way. So we've got the plans, uh, but we're, we, we can't do it quite just yet. Thank you, Mayor. And again, if you're just joining us, you can press star three on your phone to ask Mayor Keller and our city officials a question. Star three to be connected with our staff. Mayor, next we're gonna to go to Mildred. And Mildred um, is a senior citizen here in Albuquerque, uh, has a question um, about masks. Go right ahead, Mildred. Mildred, are you there? Oh, yes, I'm here. I'm sorry. All right. All I, right. as a senior citizen, I have no transportation. Uh, senior Affairs helps me out a lot during the week, but my main concern is trying to find a reasonable price for a mask, or is there anybody giving out masks for free to senior citizens and delivering to our homes? I'm not the only one without transportation. Thanks so much, uh, Mildred, and appreciate to your nod to Senior Affairs. I know that the director, Anna Sanchez, is actually on the phone too, and glad you're able to utilize those services. So let's get to your question about masks. And uh, before I, I touch on that, I did want to mention another component to Marlene's question. So, uh, so I'll get back to you, Mildred, in one second. But Marlene, I do want to go back to, I do want to mention we have four emergency health centers still open, totally open. So there's one in each quadrant of the city, and these are our sort of places of last resort. So, you know, internet's not helpful, phone's not helpful, et cetera. Uh, you can still go to those four centers, and those centers are available on our website, or you can call 311. So while our community centers are not open to the public, those four centers still are, and they have been throughout. So I am glad the city can at least offer that uh, emergency place of last resort to go. Okay, Mildred, to your question, uh, the best thing to do, I'll hand it over to our director of senior affairs to get some advice from her, but if you go to nmhealth.org, there's a list of a number of places where you can get masks. And uh, Anna, if you want to go ahead and, and add in more, uh, jump on in. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, this is Anna Sanchez with the Department of Senior Affairs and, and very happy to hear that you are uh, familiar with our services. This has come up quite a bit, um, especially with kind of just the just a continued uh, length of time that we know that we will be needing to utilize masks, I would encourage you strongly to contact our Senior Information and Assistance Line at 764-6400 because we actually have had many individuals, uh, wonderful community groups that have come out with donations. We've secured those and we are able to bring those to you. We've actually had our case managers that have been delivering more than 500 care packages and that is personal, you know, hard to obtain objects, um, items that we wanted to get for our, for our folks in the community. So please contact us at 764-6400 to request, and we can get a mask to you, especially to those that are most vulnerable at this time. Thank you, Director. And uh, Director, can you just repeat that number again one more time for folks? Certainly, it is 764-6400. That is our department's line completely dedicated to providing resources and information for seniors in our community. Terrific, thank you very much. And again, if you're just joining us, 
star three to ask Mayor Keller a question, and you'll be connected directly with our staff. Just press star three on your phone to ask Mayor Keller and our city officials a question. Next up, we're going to go to Joseph. And Joseph uh, has a question about small businesses. Um, Joseph, you are live on the line. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Keller, uh, I am a small business owner, have been for since 2000, and of course this virus has really, really affected our businesses and uh, businesses up and down central. Are you or the city doing any other uh, grants or anything in the future to help businesses stay at least at some point afloat? Um, the PPP was great to start, but, you know, to reopen, but to maintain is a whole nother issue. And then also a uh, second part of my question is, um, I understood that there was some kind of program for um, black owned businesses. And if so, is that, go across the board for all cultural uh, races, business owners? Sure, Joseph, thank you for that uh, question. And, the, you know, Central, our, our beloved Mother Road has, I mean, it has just been hit so hard. I mean, you know, the art project, of course, not to open up an old wound, but, you know, that left a lasting challenge and uh, now of course with most of our small businesses being on route 66 and then all of these restrictions obviously even too for downtown you know we had all the property damage down there and for you know folks who even happen to own a, a nightclub or something like that which are many downtown you know you you still can't even open so i just want to begin by acknowledging how difficult it's been and we're doing a couple of things so i think we, we have some a few things in the queue that should help and let me i guess begin by just handing it to cynthia armio our director of economic development to mention those and then i'll uh, uh add in some more at the end cynthia thank you mayor and thank you joseph uh, cynthia Jaramillo, director of economic development i also oversee our small business office and First, allow me to, to, to start by saying thank you for employing New Mexicans. Um, to your questions, uh, we are um, still evaluating the CARES Act funding to see how we might be able to deploy uh, more of that funding to our small businesses. Um, I encourage you to tune in over the next few days for an announcement. Um, that we will make in support of restaurants who are again facing restrictions. Um, to your second question, the City Council did pass assistance for our black community and the next step um, for that funding includes um, our black community to organize and present a plan uh, for the use of the funding which we expect uh, may include a focus on black-owned businesses. Now, some of the things that we have done in support of micro-businesses is we granted 140 Albuquerque businesses a $5,000 grant. Um, again, we're evaluating CARES funding to see if we might be able to expand that right now. Um, we have expanded our outdoor dining options, which includes sidewalks, street, and parking lots, which we're calling parklets. We've waived associated fees. We've streamlined the process for a quick turnaround um, when it comes to the planning department. Again, more to come in the next few days on this. Um, we've also allocated funding for the creative economy. Um, but uh, please, Joseph, take our small business number uh, down. I want you to keep in touch with us over the next few days. We want to make sure that we're being of assistance to you and your business. And the small business office number is 505-768-3730. Uh, that number again is 505-768-3730. Thank you, Joseph. 
Thanks, Joseph. And one other thing I would just add is that we did release a uh, um, we're, we're doing a half a million dollar marketing campaign to try and get people to come back to Route 66. And so we this has been on hold because of all the health regulations. But we're going to get that all lined up in terms of, you know, how it's going to run and and so forth so that as soon as it makes sense with the health order, we can really roll that out. And so I've, it is going to be a focus of much of our city's economic development marketing efforts uh, as soon as, you know, we're, we're allowed to open up the rest of Route 66. Lastly, too, I would just mention we are, you didn't mention where on Route 66, and that's fine, but I just want to remind folks, the city is paying to fix all the broken windows uh, in downtown. And so if a business was, if anyone's listening involved in that, they can reach out to the small business office and we will uh, take care of that so we can get you back up and open. Great, thank you, Mayor uh, Director. Again, a reminder, if you're just joining us, please press star three on your phone to ask Mayor Keller a question, star three to be connected with our staff to take down the question. Next, we're gonna go to Tori, and Tori has a question about um, our homeless population and evictions uh, and how folks might be able to help. Tori, go right ahead. Okay, so there were two questions that I had. Um, one, what can we do so that all the unhomed are not forced over to the west side? Can we, you know, I've heard now that the community centers are being used for child care. Is there a way that we can keep the kids separate and also open up part of the community centers for the unhomed so they have a place to socially distance and stay out of the heat and get fresh water? Um, is there a place that we can get donations to, like, flats of water for the unhomed so that they're not dying from dehydration? For those of us who are still homed so that we do not become unhomed, is there a way that we can do a fundraiser or are there are city funds available so that we can reinstate the moratorium on rent. And when I say reinstate the moratorium on rent, it also needs to be for all the businesses because most of these businesses, the reason that they're frustrated about opening is they still have to pay their rent space even if they're not open. Otherwise, they lose their business. So how do we go about reinstating the moratorium until coronavirus is eliminated from our culture? Thank you, uh, Tori, and some good questions in there. I'll start with a little bit on the unhomed and so forth. We, uh, number one, the, the, the Gateway Center uh, is an idea that we've had and the voters voted on it and we've been pushing uh, council to finalize this and, you know, there's been a debate over where to put it and so forth, but I just want to begin by saying this corona has highlighted once again why our city has to invest in a place where people can go on a 24-7 basis. And so uh, we're gonna continue when council comes back in August to push for that. And that's a coordinated, it's just a gateway center to get people the, the real help they need. But again, when it comes to water and shelter, we can provide that 24-7. Now in the meantime, our administration did keep the West Side shelter open for that purpose. We now have kept it open um, during the day as well, so during corona, and we do have testing out there and so forth. So the best thing we can do is get as many unhomed there uh, to at least meet those, you know, standards around, uh, you know, safety, heat, water, that kind of stuff, and also uh, some, some light medical care. So that's the best thing we can do in the short term. And there's also, though, a lot, uh, you mentioned a number of things, so let me touch on them, and then our Carol Pierce can fill in some of the gaps as well. She's our director of uh, family and community services, which includes uh, everything with respect to housing and homelessness. So with respect to ways to help, we would love donations. Uh, one AlbuquerqueFoundation.org has been coordinating our housing vouchers program, and we've been providing motel vouchers because of what you're saying, just to get people off the street temporarily during this tough time and we can definitely use more hotel vouchers. So that is a way to do, uh, to donate for that. And with respect to community centers, uh, you, we are keeping the child care community centers different than the homeless care community centers. 
And so, uh, but we only have so many community centers. So the good news is that we are kind of using that uh, flexible model to try and accommodate both challenges, both childcare and uh, unhomed, but also in separate facilities. Um, so that actually our city has been doing relatively, I think we, we've been doing quite a bit of that. And the other piece just around evictions, uh, we continue to provide rental assistance through those four public health centers that I mentioned, the city uh, public health and community centers, one in each quadrant. And Carol can maybe hand out the number for those. But, uh, and you can also donate to the rental assistance fund. This has been another uh, area that, and it applies to individuals and businesses, I mean, assuming we have enough funding. So that's a great way to help and organize people. Now, the Supreme Court and the city recall just we have in, in all city properties so for like public housing there are no evictions uh, the supreme court set up an interesting policy during corona where they've said that there's no evictions allowed in the state but you have to actually fill out some paperwork to prevent your eviction so i'm glad you brought this up because it's not automatic you have to demonstrate that you can't pay and again they, these are the supreme court's rules not ours but if people are in a situation where you're worried about paying your rent, please go to the New Mexico Supreme Court website and or call 311 and they can tell you how to do that. Because if you don't ask for that, you know, eviction, uh, stay of eviction, uh, which they will grant based on their emergency order, if you don't ask for it, then obviously an eviction can still happen. And I know there's been some confusion around that. So anyway, Carol, you should probably jump in and fill in some of these gaps. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, for our people without homes, we um, yes, we'd be far um, better served if we had a more centralized system here in our community, not um, the west side, which is 20 miles outside of town. But what we have done for those both sheltered and unsheltered is we have um, we did use our community centers for a little period of time to really pull those folks that are older with multiple medical conditions to have them less um, dense or, or too many people in one site, which can be a spread of COVID. And so we now have set up what we call a wellness hotel to really prevent the spread of COVID, which I would, will say with our system in place, we've done very well of de-intensifying and forgetting and minimizing that spread. So we are taking care of sheltered and unsheltered people in those wellness hotels. For eviction prevention, yes, the the health and social service centers that the mayor mentioned in all quadrants of our city are well positioned to help with eviction prevention. And through the one Albuquerque fund that the mayor mentioned, we are most grateful for all the donations we've received that have helped keep people in their homes by helping them with rental assistance, utilities, and more. So the main number I would suggest is to call 768-2860, or you always can call 311, depending on what part of town you live in, and they can connect you with one of our city's health and social service centers. Great, thank you. And I'm sorry, Director, can you repeat that number one more time for folks? Yes, that's 768-2860 for information about our health and social service centers. Great, thank you very much. And again, a reminder, if you're just joining us, star three on your phone to ask Mayor Keller a question, and you'll be connected with our staff. Uh, next up, Mayor, uh, we have a question um, about schools. And to let you know, this is uh, the vast majority of today's questions, uh, I think, are from parents um, uh, concerned about school, looking for information about school, uh, very timely topics. So we're going to go to Rose. Uh, and Rose uh, has a question that's really representative of a lot of what we're seeing. Uh, Rose, you're live on the line. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering about uh, the public schools, if uh, the children are going to be able to go back, and if not, if it's going to be online, if the Albuquerque public schools are going to open up for children in other communities surrounding Albuquerque where uh, the parents cannot um, 
you know, commute, but would like their children to attend schools um, in Albuquerque, if that would be an option for those parents in case we go online again, if we can do those kinds of uh, uh, transfers. Thanks so much, Rose. And, you know, uh, for the First Lady and I, this is, we talk about this every night, right? And this is unfortunately what, you know, especially last night, the school board met, if folks didn't know, and they did map out a preliminary plan. So I'll touch on that, but, you know, just want to emphasize as an APS parent uh, how, how challenging both sides of the equation have been, right? We're obviously worried about our kids' health, uh, but we're also worried about their education. Um, and so here is what APS shared yesterday, at least as an update. They are pushing back everything a few weeks uh, to just see where we're at and get by some more time. So now basically everything is planned to have a partial start after September. Uh, sorry, after August, so after Labor Day is what I meant to say. So I think September 8th is what they said will be the first day, and they want to break up the classes into two cohorts, and each cohort will go to school every other week. So that is their current plan. Uh, there are pros and cons to all the school plans. So uh, and just to, as a reminder, Often I wish that I had some uh, control over the schools as mayor, but just as a reminder for folks in Albuquerque, the, the city and the mayor does not have any control over the schools. They're run separately under the state and through the school board. So that's just kind of a, just so you know how that works, because every city is different. But for us, uh, that's what APS shared. They also shared that any parent can just opt to go full online for the, for the first semester at least. So parents do have a choice. If they don't want to send their kids, they can go full online. Uh, the alternative is this alternating week program that they announced. A couple of other aspects to your question. One is they did make it clear that things might change. So, you know, we'll see in a couple of weeks where they're at. Uh, and the online programs, by the way, do still start August 12th. So regardless of what happens online, looks like it's going to start August 12th and then in person September 8th uh, or the week after, depending on your cohort. Now, two other parts, I think, to your question. One is for the parents out there and with respect to especially people who, again, don't have that, that luxury to stay at home with their kids, uh, the city is, we are looking at alternative programming that the city might be able to offer in a healthy way that also clearly complies with the health order. We don't know what we're going to be able to do, but in the next few weeks and probably our next telephone town hall, we'll outline a way, any ways that the city is able to kind of lift up parents and kids uh, during the, the changing transition for APS. So we'll see what we can do. We're in the homework and planning phase right now. So last part about your question in terms of the kind of areas and jurisdictions as I mentioned, just because the city isn't formally connected with the school district, that's really a, a question for APS on whether, you know, outside kids can attend and that kind of thing. Um, I do just want to mention again, if folks aren't aware, though, APS's footprint is much bigger than Albuquerque. So, you know, Tejeras is part of APS, uh, Corrales, Los Ranchos, uh, the South Valley. So the APS, APS really covers the whole metro area. Uh, other than Bernalillo and Rio Rancho. So, uh, but again, questions about who can go where, R really I would uh, take those over to APS. Great, thank you very much, Mayor. A reminder, star three to ask Mayor Keller and city officials a question and you'll be connected with our staff, star three on your phone to ask a question. And next up, we have a question from uh, Andrea. And Andrea has a question about enforcing the mask rule. So go right ahead. You're live on the line. Hello? Yeah, hi, Andrea. Hi, sorry. Um, so I just had a question. So about a week ago, I, went, I was driving by a park, and I noticed that there was good over 25 people at the park without wearing masks. Now, this is a time where I didn't know who to call, what is the city going to do to help protect the people when people are just not doing what they're supposed to do? Because I tried calling the state police because that's what I thought I was supposed to call. 
And when I got a hold of an actual state police officer, he said that I had to email it to the governor's office and it had to go through a whole email system. Well, that, to me, that kind of just defeats the purpose because we need it here and now, not 24 hours or hours later. So what is the city going to do to protect those that are wearing their masks and to, um, no, I don't necessarily mean find somebody, but let the other people know that, hey, you're in a public place. You should be wearing your mask. You're protecting not only yourself, but other people as well. Thanks so much, uh, Andrea. And great question. We get this one uh, all the time as well. And maybe let me try and answer it, but also kind of clarify a few aspects. One is you were you were right to call the state police. It's unfortunate that that path it was so convoluted, but they are the primary enforcement agency, and then they have been uh, throughout. What we try and do as a city is support them and uh, help you know as needed, and so that's the case with this too. So I'll talk about how we're trying to help with this in Albuquerque, and. For us, you know, we have a, a couple of constraints, meaning that obviously APD is extremely busy, right? Crime is still unfortunately very high, and our officers continue to be uh, dealing with the shortage that they've had now for almost a decade. And we've made actually some progress towards that, but we've got a long ways to go. So just letting folks know that in terms of response times, right, we try and prioritize obviously violent crime. And so often, uh, even if we were to show up, you know, 45 minutes later, again, the people have left and so forth. So we realized it's very difficult for uh, to actually ask our police department to do that effectively. Uh, so we announced yesterday a new kind of approach for this that I think should help with exactly what you're saying. And basically, we've cross-deputized our firefighters and our open space uh, folks and our um, kind of our parking, the, the folks who give you parking tickets, uh, parking security, and uh, a couple of other departments like our code enforcement and our health enforcement. And they're now enabled to educate people to offer the masks uh, and to try and bring them into compliance. And over the course, even just to give you an idea of how, how many, um, how much this is a challenge, in the last seven days, we've done over 500 enforcement activities. Uh, all around the city. So we are working on this and with this new enforcement idea to have, you know, these other folks uh, help with enforcement, we're hoping we can do a little more of that. Now, I also do want to speak a little bit to, to practicality and, and a little bit to some of the science around spread. We know the order is cut and dry on purpose to try and increase uh, people following it. And I think we all see this as we drive around town or is I, you know, walk uh, my dog in the neighborhood, you know, it's like 75% of the city is wearing a face mask and 25% isn't. And the challenge is that we estimate, you know, tens of thousands of people aren't wearing face masks. So there is, you know, there is no way we have to try and do as much education as we can. And that's the right thing to do. But I also just want to emphasize, like, there's no way for us to, to catch every person at every park. Um, and we're trying to prioritize even within our mask enforcement. So where we will hopefully be able to respond faster and quicker is anywhere that people are in uh, proximate contact for a prolonged amount of time. So for example, you know, somebody walking their dog at a park without a mask in comparison to uh, a full contact soccer game. Uh, we should be able with these new folks to get out there and educate and bring into compliance people who are playing a contact sport. That is a high risk of spread. Conversely, you know, a singular person by themselves walking their dog, we certainly would educate them, but, you know, it's not going to be a full kind of call out for these folks. So that's a little bit of kind of clarity, and there are extreme examples of this that we're really trying to work on like buses. As of yesterday, you can't get on a city bus without a mask. Uh, we've made that totally not ambiguous. And it's similar with businesses. If a business is not uh, refusing people to come in without a mask, then we will not only hold the individual accountable, but if the business isn't helping, uh, we will shut down the business. And another example would be the airport. You cannot go in our airport without a mask now. We will not let you in. You might miss your flight, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and frankly, if you take it off in the airport, uh, we will have you removed from the premises. 
So again, that's because that is a high area. It's inside. There's people from out of state. There is surface contact. There's waiting in lines. So you know, just know that we're trying to marry enforcement with smart and targeted uh, approach uh, because you know, unfortunately, just pragmatically, you know, we, we can't just get every single situation. So we're trying to work on those that present the greatest health risk to the greatest number of people. Great, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, star three on your phone to ask Mayor Keller a question, and we're trying to get to as many as we can today. Next up, uh, we're gonna go to Lee, uh, and Lee has a question about race relations in Albuquerque. Lee, go right ahead, you're live. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm an African-American female. I moved here about three years ago. You mentioned earlier, uh, Mayor Keller, about um, race relations and improving it. Um, I'd like to know specifically what is in place or what will be your approach to um, combat what is blatantly a very racist environment here in Albuquerque, and I have to suspect all of New Mexico. There seems to be an exclusion of African Americans in so many areas. Um, I, like many other people, I frequent uh, stores, um, I shop, I'm a consumer here, and I have to say that I'm so um, saddened by the fact that there are many, many companies out there, and I don't see one African American in these stores. Um, there needs to be education, yes, but I am wondering what exactly is the approach in place now or to come to combat these types of things um, in terms of the racism, the exclusion of African Americans here in Albuquerque. Thank you, Lee, for bringing that up. And this, I'm really glad you brought it up, especially because I want to share some of the other things that, that I have learned, at least from folks uh, both in the black community and around uh, our community in general, which is that uh, I have consistently heard that, you know, we have sort of a tricultural myth, if you will, where, you know, we, we believe we're a very diverse city. And I mean, we are statistically, but um, we often forget uh, very significant communities in our own story and in our own perception and in our anti-racism efforts. Uh, and that typically happens to be the African-American community and actually uh, uh, the Vietnamese community uh, has voiced this for years. And we've got to get past that kind of tricultural myth. I think in, it, it, it's something that has been a challenge for a long time. And we're doing some specific things for this. So I'm going to tee up a couple of people to speak to this, but let me also mention because I think what you brought up is something that is interesting for people who are born and raised here. Uh, we talk about anti-racism, but at least, again, what I've heard in my conversations, and, and I've tried to really listen, that in our town especially is different than anti-blackness. And I've heard that a lot of folks feel that in a way that actually could be worse than other places. And it's something that we need to understand as a city of Albuquerque, because I do think it, it is somewhat unique just because of the other diverse aspects of our population. So I want to really respect that. And this also is part of why we created the Black Fund, which was mentioned earlier. So this was something we did in step with uh, many of the individuals in different parts of the black community. And they basically highlighted that even monetarily, you know, the amount of funding we give to various groups is just, you know, crumbs end up ending uh, going to the black community. And so we tried to reset those expectations that, that should have been reset a long time ago. But there's a lot I could go into on this, but let me uh, create some space for, for two of our experts. One, to talk about legally. If you have examples of racism in a place of business or in a city facility, we actually have an office that would love to take on this fight. And so Tori Jacobus can outline her efforts for that. And also with respect to what we're doing with law enforcement, we are at the forefront nationally about creating a uh, civilianized response to a lot of challenges. And so uh, Mariella can speak to that. So uh, anyway, Tori, why don't you go first uh, and tell us about our Office of Civil Rights. 
Thank you, Mayor Keller, and thank you, Lee, for the, those questions. So I run the Office of Civil Rights here at the city of Albuquerque, and our goal is to protect and prohibit discrimination in the community. And so that includes in housing, in public places, and employment. So Lee, I believe all of that addresses the question that you asked. Um, individuals can contact my office and get more information on discrimination and what to do when they face discrimination and racism in the community. And it can be limited to just information or we can actually file a complaint and seek enforcement action against the businesses who are accused of discrimination. My office can be reached at 768-4595. Again, that's 768-4595. Thank you so much, Mayor Keller, and thank you, Lee. Thanks, and Mariella, you want to go in, and also just if you could mention a little bit about the Office of Equity and Inclusion. We we created this when we yeah. came in, and uh, and and actually, uh, you might highlight Scott's role too. We we just are increasing our capacity to deal with some of these issues. Sure. Hi, Lee. Uh, so my name is Mariella Ruiz, and I'm taking the coordinator position with our new Albuquerque Community Safety Department. Uh, this is ultimately a, a third response to uh, fighting crime and ultimately decriminalizing our response to mental health, homelessness, and addiction issues. And not only that, but we know that um, right, people of color tend to be uh, targeted in many of these cases when it comes to crime and some of the issues that come through this. And it's, we need to get away from um, criminalizing poverty and criminalizing um, issues that we know are historical and are um, have been created through systemic uh, uh, racism and oppression. So we are acknowledging that 100%, and we want to make sure that we're delivering the right response to the right call and at the right time. And that means that we will work with our police officers and our firefighters um, to really be addressing issues. But uh, on top of all that, we know we have to have a human-centered approach. We have to address some of these these systemic issues in a way that is um, humanistic and um, appropriate for communities uh, across the city, right? Whether it be African Americans, Asians, immigrants, um, you know, mixed status families, it's we've got to be um, understanding of all the different types of populations and communities that we're working with. And we've got to be transparent about it, right? These are challenging conversations, and we can't be afraid of that. So, and then additionally, we've been working, I, I currently work in the Office of Equity and Inclusion where we've been doing tons of work trying to really address these same issues um, with all communities. And so, um, and I know, uh, Mayor, you guys have brought on um, Scott, who um, I think we've just now brought in, so I'm not too familiar with his role that he'll be playing, but I do know that we're excited to have somebody who can really help um, collaborate with us when it comes to African American issues and how we can really be addressing and working better with our communities. Um, you can reach us, just so you know, we have a new website. Uh, specifically, it's cabq.gov slash ACS. And then you can also reach me directly at ACS at cabq.gov. Thank you so much. Great, thanks so much, Mariella. And just to, to close this out a little bit, the, uh, the we're partnering with the Black Chamber, which is also very new. That was just created like two years ago, uh, and the One Albuquerque Fund, which which happens to have a African American chairperson, uh, as well as some of the uh, African awareness um, organizations uh, that historically, again, have just been their their voice hasn't been heard by the rest of the city. So we're working on them with sort of telling the black story in Albuquerque, which is also fascinating. So for those of you who are aware, uh, we've had a vibrant community here uh, over 100 years and has contributed in all sorts of ways. So that's just trying to go full circle back to with what you mentioned about uh, folks also don't even know our own story here. We're omitting uh, the story of our black community, whether it's intentional or unintentional, and we're trying to work on that too. Great, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, star three to ask a question. It looks like we're gonna have about time for uh, one or two more quick ones here, uh, and then we will wrap up 
uh, with a closing from the mayor. So uh, next up, we've got Bill, uh, and Bill has a question about uh, seating in the city. Bill, go right ahead. Yes, I um, appreciate you having me on uh, with these questions. The questions are uh, concerning that during this corona uh, time, I live in the Knob Hill area, and there is a lot more foot traffic on the sidewalks and bicycle traffic uh, on the road crossing lead and coal uh, at a lot higher rate than, than it is at other times. Um, and the speed is still an issue uh, on, on those roads. Uh, the mayor, you did recently put up speed signs uh, to saying 30 miles an hour. Um, that really hasn't helped much. Um, and we, I'm inquiring about the possibility of speed bumps or uh, more motorcycle uh, police to give out tickets. People, uh, I mean, I can look out my window right now as I'm speaking and see cars going faster than 30 miles an hour. That's my Thank question. you, Bill. And, um, yeah, this has been, as, as you and I both know, man, this has been a problem for a long time, I remember. I think it was, oh, maybe 20 years ago when we narrowed it, um, uh, maybe it was 10 years ago, down to two lanes, you know, from three. And then, as you mentioned, we've tried to time all the lights. We thought that would really help. Um, so, you know, I think going forward, there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, we continue to articulate this need for more uh, just community police officers, and that includes traffic. And so we have gotten 200 more over the last two years. We need at least 200 more. But in terms of traffic, that's just a question of where where we put the, the folks, you know, with the radar guns. And so, you know, we can, I know we've done some operations there before. We could certainly look at some more. So I'm going to hand it over to Commander Josh Brown. His area is the valley. It's not yours. But he can speak a little bit to this uh, generally, how we might do that. I think we're also interested in the concept of these speed trailers. I know Santa Fe uses these, and there are some legal challenges with them, uh, but that might be a more effective tool. Um, and lastly, just with respect to, you know, I, I've been interested in maybe changing just the nature of those roads, be it speed bumps or making them residential and so forth. And, you know, I think at the end of the day, it, it really just takes five votes on council. Those things do have to go through council. And also, as, as you know, there's this entity called the Council of Governments because those are part of the artery set up, and so they have to work on that too. So, uh, you know, it's a work in progress, and I do think it's at least better than it was last year, but I completely agree with you. It's a huge problem. So let me allow uh, our commander to share a few words on this, but before I do that, I also just want to mention one other thing. Corona has been terrible for speeding in our town, and what I mean by that is there's been fewer cars and there have been many more people just flagrantly speeding all over the city. So I do just want to acknowledge that it's actually not just lead and coal. Um, we have seen challenges around speed control, you know, way higher than ever in the last five or six years during Corona. And, you know, there's lots of reasons probably why, but it's all related to Corona. So commander, any other thoughts you want to add in on this? No, that's absolutely uh, correct. During COVID, we've seen an uptick in drag racing, um, cruising, and just, you know, all-out speeders and blowing through lights and traveling at higher rates of speed than normal just due to those open roads. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out, too, is, you know, during all this time, and we have officers responding to calls, um, you know, if we have these issues coming in, we'd, lo we'd love to hear about them. Um, we work you know, hand-in-hand hand with our motor officers, our DWI officers, we can do uh, operations to where, you know, we'll target a specific area. Um, I mean, for your area, Bill, it's, you know, it's the Southeast Substation and it's Commander Yada. And if you contact the Southeast Substation at 256-2050 with some of your complaints on the speed, they can uh, come up with some options for you there as well. Um, we can also talk to Commander Donovan Rivera, who's our traffic uh, commander. Um, I know they've been tasked with part of our gun violence initiative of targeting those areas as well. Um, so we'll, uh, what we like to do is get every, bring everybody into the table to kind of try to help those areas out the best we can. 
Great, thank you, Commander and Mayor. And we're going to squeeze one quick comment in here. Uh, we've got a comment from Martha uh, about COVID fatigue, and then we'll go uh, to the mayor for a closing uh, remarks. Martha, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, I am a nurse. I went to UNM and went into the military, returned back here 25 years later. And I have to say uh, I'm highly uh, complimentary of the mayor for several things. Uh, One thing was the 4th of July display. I know that took a lot of coordination, but it was very well placed to where people could enjoy the celebration of our independence, which we don't really feel like we have right now, but in a safe way. So I really appreciate the time and effort that it took to get that done. Um, Additionally, um, COVID fatigue, I think pretty much everyone has it. (laughs) We're all tired of it. And um, uh, Mayor Kelly, when you were speaking that our numbers have risen, which they have dramatically, um, you said, New Mexico started off strong, and we were we were flat, and and we absolutely were. New Mexico has done a really great great job. You know, this is just the tail of the beast coming around, and um, so it's really important for you to continue to speak to us with such positivity because that will help us with our corona fatigue. So I just really wanted to compliment you on on your management and your speech and just what you're doing. I think I think our community is doing much better than others, and I appreciate that the mayor um, has a has a positive outlook because it will help us. It will help the whole community in the long run. That's it. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much, Martha. I, I really appreciate that. And um, first, also, thank you for your service, both for, to our country and uh, now in your in your current role. So, um, and on Fourth of July, by the way, just you know, it is it was really hard to pull that off. So, our shout outs to our, our Parks and Rec team and so forth. Uh, they also they deserve the the lion's share of the credit there. So, thank you for your. Um, uh, dash of positivity as well. And I think that's a good introduction really into some closing remarks on my end, which um, really echo, Martha, I think what you positioned in a sense that, you know, first, I want to thank everyone for being on this call and for joining and participating. One of the important things I think we can do during this time to deal with that corona fatigue is just be informed as, as possible. And we know there's, you know, there's lots of sources of information, whether it's the TV or the internet. And I think what we found is you kind of got to take info from different places because, you know, there's also a lot of myths out there. And so for us, I know in our city, we've got to continue to forge our own path. And again, for when folks look around at other cities or have family in other cities, uh, and again, just appreciate what you said, Martha, uh, we've done a good job and we can keep doing this. And I believe that actually our city in many ways uh, it is special in, in a lot of ways. Uh, we have our amazing open space. We actually have way more parks than most cities. Uh, and we have a bunch of great hospitals, which also has really played to our favor. And I think also we have a tremendous sense of, of family and unity that not every city has. And so I'm grateful to be raising my uh, family here and also to have been born and raised here. And I know the vast majority of us cherish really that uniqueness uh, of this place and believe in our potential. And so for us, uh, our potential is to really live up to what we did over the last six months, which has continued to be one of the healthiest large cities in America. And it's tough because we know we have our challenges and that cases are on the rise and that we have to stay vigilant. But I do think that we demonstrated some real leadership last time around, and I want to continue to do that. And it has to do with our spread rate, our positive case numbers, our testing ability, our availability of beds. All of those were at the top of the good lists on. But it is still, in many ways, up to us individually to keep that up and to make sure that we do stay on the top of those lists. And it can be very difficult when we know, you mentioned that the tale of of the beast kind of coming around. And that's true. We are feeling that. 
And so uh, we've just got to stay strong like we did last time around and wear our masks, maintain social distancing, uh, try and help each other, try and focus on compliance and, and also, uh, you know, respect each other. And so for us, it's about staying healthy and safe. And I think we're going to get through this together and we're going to show just how uh, special a city Albuquerque is. So we'll look forward to speaking with you um, Whoever dials in again or on the internet or if I happen to bump into you with my mask on at the grocery store, uh, we will talk to you uh, soon again in the near future. Thanks so much and have a great rest of the day. Well, thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you to all of our City of Albuquerque officials who have joined us today to provide key information for everyone. And thank you again to all of you for participating in today's telephone town hall. Please visit cabq.gov for the latest information, or you can call 311. And if you'd like to leave a message for the mayor or we didn't get to your question, please remain on the line and you can leave a voicemail in just a moment. This concludes the telephone town hall. Thank you. Mm -hmm.